Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Shakul, and I'm joined here by two wonderful humans, Malcolm and Jenny. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Shakul. Thank you, Shakul, for inviting us back. So today we are going to be having a very robust chat about oil because um, Malcolm and Jenny, uh, we've been kind of in touch for a long time now and they've been having a very consistent message about a whole food plant-based diet, just like we do. And, um, you know, oil from, from our perspective is a more processed type of food. And um, so we want to just discuss a little bit about what oil does uh, to the body and then we're going to go into some of the research because there's, there's a little bit of noise in the movement around uh, olive oil and extra virgin olive oil and and the so-called purported health benefits of that so we're going to ask Malcolm and Jenny what their thoughts are and what the research shows about that but let's just start off with you know what is oil and 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 kind of like let's just discuss what it can do to the body and from, from like a more like generalistic standpoint. And then maybe we'll kind of filter into the more micro areas of, of, of the research. Okay. <laughs> um, oil's a food extract. You know, it's not a whole plant food. You know, you can have mm. some oily plants, you can have some flax. Even oats have 15% of their calories from fats. Mm. But when you're talking about oil in a bottle, that's a processed food. You know, uh, if it's an olive, someone's taken those olives and they've put them through a process that's removed all the dietary fiber, most of the nutrients, and concentrated just one fraction of the food. It, it really should be compared with um, turning some, you know, fruit or sugar cane into, um, into refined sugar. So that's mm. how it sits. Um, it's very high in calories, you know, it's the highest calorie they, you can eat. All, all the oils are all, all pretty much the same. Uh, it's got about twice as much calories per weight as sugar has. So, mm -hmm. you know, a tablespoon of oil, an Australian tablespoon, the biggest in the world, 20 mils, has 160 calories, about the same as a can of Coke. Um, and nutrient-wise, um, depending on the type of oil, it may have some, some of the fats that we need in very small amounts that we don't need to drink oil for, the omega-6 fats and the omega-3. If it's olive oil, it's hardly got any omega-3s. Many of the other seed oils are also uh, um, quite low and relatively low in omega-3s. Um, and about the only other nutrient in there is some vitamin E, you know, no one in, in the natural world ever sort of had vitamin E deficiency. There's lots of our food uh, is rich in vitamin E. Um, so that sums it up, um, mm. you know, of what the, what the composition of the mm. oil is. And I guess when people start, you know, and they, they told me, um, you know, I've sometimes been accused of, accused of having strong views on oil, I start off by trying to present just the basic facts or just open up a food composition table, have a look there. Um, if you add, because it's so concentrated and, and, you know, like a lot of calories, not much volume, you can add some olive oil to your meal and it gives a big boost in calories. Um, and if you eat about the same amount of volume of food, you won't notice or you may not notice those extra calories. Um, you know, and there have been some um, olive oil studies here in Melbourne, uh, you know, studying extra virgin olive oil, where they've asked subjects to add, you know, three tablespoons a day to their meals, and they find that during the time they do that, they eat uh, more than 400 calories, more food per day without realising it. And now, of course, you could be someone that's really good, you have a you know, you, your appetite control, body fat control centres just perfect and so you just scale back everything you eat to compensate for that well if you do that then you'll get less nutrients you know if oil made up if you did really have those three tablespoons that's about 480 calories about a quarter of a small person's calorie needs for the day um, you know if compared to whole foods you'd be getting um, a quarter less of all the nutrients a quarter less iron a quarter less fiber so Basically, if you're adding oil to your food, you're either going to increase your calorie intake, reduce your nutrient intake, or some combination of both. There's no sort of third way around it. 
Absolutely. I think you raise a very interesting point there because um, a lot of people, when they talk about oil, most people are against eating processed foods and, and most people would be very much against wanting to add you know, processed carbohydrates or sugars into their diet. I think it's quite well, um, um, I guess it's really well thought of that we don't want to add processed sugars into our diet. And everyone has kind of accepted that, right? It's very well accepted that that's what we should do. But um, when it comes to things like processed proteins and processed fats, there's less acceptance around the fact that we shouldn't be processing these macronutrients and, and isolating all the other things. Um, uh, and we should be actually consuming these things, even though you know there may be a better way of getting around that. So, what you know, the whole the whole conversation is don't eat processed sugar. But if it's processed fat, it's, it's suddenly healthy. You know, it doesn't logically okay. doesn't make a lot of yeah. Po processed protein is a totally. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I guess we could have a totally different discussion about that. But I think um, yeah, we won't cover it today. But the, yeah. the concept here is a concept that. Uh, a lot of nutrition experts don't seem to understand is the concept of displacement. Mm. That is, you know, our, our bodies, we essentially re do a reasonable job of regulating how many calories we eat per day, you know. And so if you add calories of protein powder or oil or sugar to your diet and, and you don't gain weight, then you're eating calories of the oil or the protein powder. Let's say the protein powder, you're eating calories of that pea protein instead of calories of peas or of oats. And the protein concentrate, therefore, by eating that, you'll be removing from the diet something else. And something else that if it's a whole plant food will provide, for example, dietary fiber, which um, in the area that you work in, uh, gut health uh, is the uh, number one nutrient that we should be concerned about. Absolutely. It's very, very important. And, and as you mentioned before, oil just removes all the fiber from, from that plant or wherever you're getting that ball from. There's absolutely no fiber in there. And again, every time you eat something that doesn't have fiber, you've given up the opportunity to put some fiber in your body and, and increase the diversity of your gut microbiome. Um, Jenny, do you have anything to add to that? Well, there's many things I can add, but it, specifically <laughs> yeah. that question, probably not. Um, yeah. Yeah. But let's let's go into. I mean, because you've done, I, I've heard you talk a, a fair bit about you know uh, oil and 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 the calorie density and how it can affect your body. Shall we shall we talk about the the effects it can have for you know. Um, for weight and for weight gain and, and people who are thinking about losing weight but then secondly also what are the some of the harmful effects of putting processed fats like oils into the body what does it do to our body you know I, I, obviously i'm aware that it affects the arteries what are the mechanisms that that go along to do that i think first of all I remind people again of that displacement when you're putting mm. that even if the oil was fairly neutral on our effect on health when you're putting that oil into the body, you're displacing um, fiber and nutrients. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. I think, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, I'm just adding in randomly in the wrong place here. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I think practitioners who have more clinical experience um, often see the effect of, uh, of uh, you know, more oil in the diet. Mm. Um, you know, we find that the, the, the man with heart disease who has, still has a bit of a belly doesn't lose the belly and he really needs to. Or the, the person with osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, you know, while they're eating the oil, it continues to, um, um, you know, increase the inflammation in those joints. Um, or probably the most common nutrient deficiency perhaps in the world, um, the woman who has... Um, uh, low iron levels you know continues to have low iron levels because the oil and also the refined carbohydrates displace iron containing foods from the diet so we see those things in in uh, clinical practice where what is apparently a little bit of oil just stops just it is a barrier to the person getting mm. the best result I mean, Absolutely. one of the things that, that we see a lot of, I mean, there's this idea of, but it's only a little bit. 
mm-hmm. um, and you know, how could that have an Im- impact and you know the, we're being too fussy about it um, we have so many stories I know they're anecdotes um, from you know our clinical practice our, um, our seven day immersion program of people who have actually been doing a whole food plant based diet for a period of time but haven't been fussy about avoiding oil mm. and when they experience like six or seven days of eating oil-free, you know, low salt, sugar, whole food, plant-based, that suddenly after five days, their fingers, whether it's rheumatoid, whether it's osteoarthritis, their knee pain from osteoarthritis, they've woken up in the morning and said, wow, it's gone. They had no idea that this could happen. And, uh, and so that's what's made us a, that little bit more fussy in the advice we give people and say, just try it. And it's not just about do you add oil into a salad? It's do you read every label of every food that you pick up and see, you know, what impact do those couple of grams of oil in the instant rice sachet in that little jar of some, you know, nice little pasta sauce? What impact are they having? And they seem to really add up and make a difference to people. Mm. Yeah, if you, if you don't look at the label, I mean, just something simple as raisins or sultanas, they have oil in it, most of the packets. You don't even realize it's a minuscule amount, but it's there, you know? Um, and so, yeah, good point about making sure that we're actually turning the packet around and actually seeing what's in there before we purchase it because it can make a big difference. And, and you say that it's only a little bit right. But say, you know, you have a little bit. Over the weeks and months and years, that little bit adds up to liters of the stuff, you know. Mm. And it's not that easy to get it out of the body um, once it's in there. Um, as, as John McDougall has his famous quote, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, that little bit for just today, if we have very short, short-term thinkers as humans. You know, we just focus on what, what's happening. We don't actually think about the long-term outcomes of some of the decisions we make. And that, you know, it's a very good point you made there, but that little bit can actually start adding up to a lot um, over a period of time. Imagine the amount, how much oil someone consumes over their lifetime if it's only a little bit every day. That's a lot. Well, uh, and I, I think, um, you know, <clears throat> probably all have a tendency to um, um, uh, underestimate how much of the things we eat mm. that we don't think that, that we personally think it wouldn't it, we should you know we don't think we should be eating much of and we tend to overestimate the things that, that we that the foods that that we um, think we should be eating more of so we remember the days when we ate more vegetables and forget about the days when we um, had a vegetable-free meal. And we'll, we'll um, and I think that goes, I see this a lot with dairy products. I don't eat much dairy, they say, you know, except for the yogurt with breakfast and the latte and a bit of cheese with lunch and the milk protein bar and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, think, I think also if, you, if you're consistently using that little bit of oil at home, then you get some neuroadaptation. That is, you grow accustomed to it. You know, if I go out and if I eat some oily food and put it in my mouth, it feels greasy in my mouth. If it's an appreciable amount, you know, it feels afterwards like I've got a rock sitting in my stomach, my digestion slowed right down. Mm. But um, if you regularly eat that little bit of oil at home, then you won't notice just how oily food prepared by others or food at restaurants is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So. Let's, um, I think what a lot of people are interested in uh, hearing about is some of the research around specifically olive oil and, and you know, the, talk, the talk about extra virgin olive oil and, and the fact that it's being now touted as, um, as, you know, being quite a healthy thing, something you should add to your diet rather than you may want to add it or probably a best to avoid it. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on some of these studies? Can you, can you describe some of these studies, how they're being conducted? And, 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 and are they correct or is this, is, is there, are there some flaws in them? Before we get to that, there's one thing I'd like to bring up with the research. Um, sure. And I'm, in, I'm indebted to 
Dr. John McDougall in particular for this, for some of his um, early writings, you know, he's been writing newsletters for, for many decades and everything he wrote would be very well researched. Um, uh, he has exposed to my eyes and I've, I've got the, the full text of articles going back into, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago, which showed me how he came to the picture of the danger of oil. So mm -hmm. when you're looking for the research, it's not just about, you know, we'll come to, to the recently usually industry funded research, mm -hmm. but there's little pockets of research that demonstrate things like the impact of fats from any source. Um, and, and so it's, it's building that picture and, you know, we can name half a dozen articles that talk about, um, you know, it's not just the oils, it's, it's all the sort of concentrated fats and mm. studies where you had, um, you had a group of um, uh, people with mostly rheumatoid arthritis, and this is, I think, mm. a study from the 1980s, mm. who were put on, they were, went on a fast for a period of time and symptoms were all alleviated. They were then put on a vegan diet, but the vegan diet was um, not free of the processed fats and the majority of subjects got their symptoms back. Mm. And when I actually saw the paper that McDougall had, I, I actually gave me a copy of it and he'd highlighted this section. It was like, that was a clue that the vegan diet is not enough. Mm. And uh, as I say, there is science out there. There's science comparing, you know, walnuts to olive oil and olive oil doesn't come out um, well. Even so... extra virgin olive oil <laughs> comes mm. out. Uh, the very best it comes out in, in the, in the uh, uh, studies is as neutral. neutral. And, there, and there is, of course, the research that um, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn quotes, um, you know, of the impact of all oils, including olive oil, has a detrimental um, effect on, on artery health. Mm. So I'll leave you to pick up the more recent before, research. Yeah, before we go into the more <laughs> recent research, I think one of the points you made was also quite a good one, is that um, traditionally a whole food plant-based diet is um, thought of as a low-fat diet, you know, because you can eat a whole food plant-based diet and have a lot of fat in it if you want to, right? Um, you can have a lot of nuts and seeds and avocados and coconut and, and that kind of stuff. But the, um, you know, when I started doing my research into this almost 10 years ago, a lot of the research, you know, you had China study, you had the Star Solution, you had Dr. Esselstein's book. And that was where a lot of the information was coming from. And they would always highlight the, the importance of keeping everything low fat um and you know somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of your calories from fat i think is generally accepted in the whole food plant-based community um and um I, i've seen in, in recent times that that message has been kind of eroding away you know it's okay if you eat as long as it's a whole food it's okay it doesn't matter how much fat you eat and things like that but i think it does matter and um and, and it does make it harder uh, from a digestive perspective, I've noticed that some people eat a lot more fat. It does slow things down. It makes it harder for the food to digest, um, and and it can actually um, make it harder to alleviate the symptoms of IVD if your if your fat content in your diet is very high. So I think thank you for pointing that out. Mm. So, well, I'm glad you picked up on that because mm. that is really part of the whole. Um, when when someone says to me, "Oh, you know, show us the research that you know extra virgin olive oil is harmful," well, mm. let's come back to the research showing the effect of one high fat meal on mm -hmm. the body, mm. and there is plenty of that. And then there's the research that has been conducted by um, uh, you know people within the plant based movement, such as Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Neil Barnard. Um, their work is with the low fat end of the diet and as a nutritionist who loves looking up food composition tables and and looking at diet diaries what people don't realize if you think you're going to keep your fat intake around 10 to 15 percent of calories and you add that handful of almonds you've smashed it you've smashed yeah. your 15 percent <laughs> you've had a fairly good meal with you know oats and beans and maybe just that little bit of you know flaxseed and maybe a bit of tahini and something and you then add an ounce of nuts 
you it's really hard to stay under 15 percent very hard and when i hear even the experts in plant-based nutrition talk about the importance of adding nuts and seeds i just think they actually don't realize how that translates in a in a diet diary absolutely and, and you know if you haven't been following someone on a on like a app like chronometer or actually seeing the amount of calories they eat and how many calories are coming from fat you don't actually understand how quickly because all the whole foods they all have fat even a potato has a little mm -hmm. bit of fat a banana has a you know three or four percent fat uh, so uh, oats, have a oats, of, mm -hmm. yeah, oats are quite high in fat absolutely even the greens like lettuce has a fair amount i mean very low in calories but it has a fair amount of fat in it so um if you're if, as you said if you're eating that you're already at about eight or nine percent if you're eating nothing with something without any extra fat in it and then if you add the overt fats avocados and nuts and seeds and especially oils um you're going to go well way, way past 15 percent. you're going to get closer to 20 to 30 percent without we, we see um, quite a lot of diet diaries and uh, hmm. yeah by the time they have you know five <laughs> you know, four, four or five tablespoons of different nuts and seeds with their mm. porridge and mm. the cashew sauce, you know, and the avocado and the meal and things. You start looking through the diet diary mm. and uh, doing back mm. at the end of like calculations and thinking, boy, this is, uh, this is, this is like a 30% plus yeah. fat. Um, it's almost like nowadays, Jenny, we feel like we have to justify our position. Like, why are you old school, low fat diet? Low, low fat diets are dead. You know, haven't you seen ironically a lot of the work to try and dispel the whole low fat thing um it's been funded by you know the dairy industry for example because nearly all their products are high in fat so meat and dairy industry hate that stuff mm. and of course um the, the nut industry now and now we've you know made an olive oil industry and and they will be working very hard to, to sort of try and sort of um discredit that sort of low fat but in whole foods plant-based you know, there's a, there's a bit of debate about, you know, reasonable debate about, you know, how relatively starchy or relatively, you know, oil-based, that is high nuts, I'm not talking about oil, um, how, where should you be on that uh, starches, fats um, spectrum on the whole foods mm -hmm. plant-based diet? Well, the runs, are, the runs are on the board for the low-fat end of the spectrum, as Jenny said. You know, um, Pritikin, McDougall, all those people reversing disease, um, you know, Ornish, Esselstyn, Bernard, uh, um, it was all the low fat end of the spectrum. And if you start to look at the parts of the world that they sort of, you know, the more traditional diets, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's like, you know, rice and potatoes and sweet potatoes and um, corn and beans and squash. And so, you know, the traditional predominantly plant-based diets around the world, in, in most situations, except perhaps for a few little spots in the Mediterranean, mm. uh, generally quite low-fat diets. Um, and as you alluded to, um, you know, when you eat, um, a high fat meal it gets it gets slowly absorbed into the blood and the blood gets lipemic that is mm. the blood goes a little milky um, and that's not really good for um, the blood viscosity for the blood flow um, it, it also particularly if it's if you do it with oils there's studies that, that find that um, you know whether it's a saturated or polyunsaturated fat it's both going to make the blood lipemic. It's both going to activate the blood clotting system, you know, through factor seven and make it more likely that you have a blood clot. Mm. Um, it's both going to impair the endothelium. Um, the endothelium issue, the, you know, there's been some tricks there, like flow mediated dilation is the, the, is the, the test for things that damage endothelium, um, where mm. you give someone the test food, and then you put a tourniquet around their arm, cut off the circulation for a period of time. Must be a bit uncomfortable. And, and then you put a, then you let it go and put a transducer over the brachial artery. And what you're trying to see is how much the arteries can dilate in response to a period of having no circulation. Mm. If you give someone plain olive oil, you get quite a big reduction in flow-mediated dilation. If you give someone a sausage and egg McMuffin, boy, those arteries are going to have trouble dilating for the next uh, uh, five hours. Mm. Um, the, um, 
And, you know, to be honest, there's been some studies where they've tried giving different foods, different fats, and then given the person a meal that they know is going to damage the artery function, the, the flow median of dilation, you know, the sausage or whatever. Um, and when, they've, when, in, when they use the best quality extra virgin olive oil, the effect was a bit more neutral uh, on, on, the, on the artery. It didn't make it any better. It didn't blunt the, the um, damage done when the person subsequently ate you know, some really bad fats. One study, they compared it to walnuts. The walnuts did blunt it. Oh, uh, and then, of course, if you give someone some fruits and vegetables and then measure their response to um, uh, unhealthy fats, then you see a huge difference. It, it really reduces the damage that those fats do to artery flow. But the very best, the best olive oil can do is sort of a bit neutral, not make it much worse. Mm -hmm. Olive oil industry, yeah. though, all the researchers have found a new, uh, found another way of measuring endothelium. Um, I think it's called uh, ischemic reactive hyperemia, the flow of the blood back into the skin after circulation is cut off. However, it's not well validated. It's not correlated with long-term heart health like the other method is. Um, so we sort of mm. tend to sort of not take too much notice of the um, olive oil studies and have used that method. Mm. Um, in terms, can I go back to good fats? Because you're saying okay. about the fats. There's yeah. all this stuff out there. Good fats, good fats, good fats. Everyone sort of, it's like some chant. But no, not I'm many not a huge fan of that term. <laughs> no, 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 it's out there. Good fats, good fats. It almost could be a nice song. Um, but, you know, when people say it, it's all, well, okay, if I think of a good fat, um, okay, I'd like it to have, you know, a, a lot of essential fats in it. I would want it to be very low in saturated fats, no trans fats. Uh, and I want it to have, you know, um, omega-6s and omega-3s. And I want it to have a, you know, reasonable ratio of 6s and 3s. Like, I don't mm. want it to be have too much omega-6 or too little omega-3. Mm. Uh, but then if I'm thinking of food as sort of a bit of a package deal, each food item, I also want it to have dietary fibre and nutrients attached to it. So, you know, the walnuts and the flax sort of start to look like, you know, we could call them good fats. So mm. We've already talked about reasons why we wouldn't recommend eating, make, basing most of your calories on them. Mm. But then you look at olive oil and you go, good fats, really? You think this is good fats? It's like, you, you realise this is about 15% saturated fats and, and the, the, even the, the most conservative heart bodies say we should be working down towards less than 10% saturated fat. So it wouldn't matter how much olive oil I add to my diet, I'm never going to reduce my total percent saturated fats down to that 10 because it's already 15. And but good fats, good fats, well, there's lots of omega-6 essential fats in, the, in our diet. There's no trouble sourcing them, even when we don't need oil. Omega-3s, though, I mean, you pointed out they're in the green leafy vegetables, they're in quite a few things. Um, but there's hardly any of them. If there's any fat we need more of, it's the omega-3s. There's hardly mm -hmm. any in, in olive oil like it's less than one percent it's mm. sort of uh i think their ratio of omega sixes to threes we probably want to on average get down to less than four to one and it's uh it's something like 13 to one mm. um so when you start to look at that you start to think hmm, it's not a very good fat the one of the biggest arguments that we ha have have faced is the uh, is what about all the mediterranean diet studies and it's here where people often conflate, confuse um, a, a diet, a Mediterranean versus added olive oil diet. That is, and, and um, so those studies that have shown that a diet with olive oils help, uh, gets better health outcomes. And, and it's not always a sure, like, um, you know, the big Predi Med study didn't actually find a statistically significant reduction in heart events, although there was a reduction in strokes. Um, all those, those big studies using a Mediterranean diet, of course, include more fruits and vegetables. And, you know, they tend to include some uh, um, legumes and some nuts and some whole grains. And generally they have a lot less meat and a lot less processed food. And then people come along and say, see what the olive oil diet did? They had better health outcomes. Of course, there was one study that compared a Mediterranean diet with um, a low-fat vegan diet, um, mainly looking at weight loss. And, of course, the low-fat vegan diet killed it. They lost weight much more effectively. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the big studies, like the Predi-Med study, 
Like you they give subjects, you give subjects, <laughs> provide subjects with some counseling. of the food and counselling for five years, and the subjects lose, you know, less half, than a kilo. Less than a kilo. <laughs> I'd ask for my money back if someone gave me a diet program and I was overweight to start with. It did that. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Does that? Absolutely. Does that? Yeah. Confusing. Yeah, that's that's a good point. It's, it is confusing. It is confusing, it is confusing because there's 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 very good ways to twist the, the the facts. And one of the things that I always try to look at when I'm looking at some research is what are you comparing this to? Um, and I, I think I think that's where I, that's where we need to go next. Is that when we are looking at the research and they're looking at things like oils and olive oil what are they comparing it to and and most of the time i don't feel like the comparison is satisfactory for my um you know i guess skepticism on the topic um in that i'm coming from a point where uh the the research that shows that you can reverse heart disease and diabetes and 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 those things are done without oil so that's the standard that we need to to look at and then you need to show that you can do that or better with the oil in the diet, which no one's doing at the moment. Um, and and so when you do when you do a when you do a study or you do research, well, surely we need to be aiming at at oil versus the whole food plant based diet, right? And that automatically doesn't mm-hmm. have oil in it. Um, so would you like to discuss that and and how they kind of um, you know what kind of comparisons they they use to get to these favorable outcomes that we see and there's another layer to add in there and that is Mm. what type of research is it have they um just uh, tracked a cohort for a decade or two and Mm -hmm. done you know a food frequency questionnaire every so often which is based on recall which people always you know paint their diet in the best possible light when they are asked to recall is it that or is it an intervention where they're locked up in a metabolic ward and and they're fed you know like Mm -hmm. how, how much room is there for accuracy or, or um, inaccuracy in terms of even what they ate, mm. um, whether it's dietary pattern versus... Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's really important and comes to that very latest research or one of the two pieces of really recent yeah. research. Yeah, and <laughs> like I, I sort of like that's a very good point, that compared to what? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like... Um, it's, it's like the, the study done in Australia on uh, that hit the media a couple of years ago about um, you know eggs don't worse than cardiovascular risk measures, and what what the media release didn't say it was compared to having meat for breakfast. Um, <laughs> so we always have to say we also need to say and associated with what, you know, like um, associated with what. And that is, you know, that's, we suspect this is why the, the nurses, uh, the Harvard Health Studies that gave some potatoes such a bad rap, is that, you know, you think how those people eating potatoes, you know, mm. the French fries were roasted around in fat around the piece of meat, mm. or the mashed with nice butter, butter, or they were cream. baked and, and had it lathered with sour cream. Mm. Um, and cheese, the, the don't forget the cheese. The cheese, yeah, the cheese. Um, yeah, so some of the, the big studies, and, and I think some of the biggest ones are those Harvard Health Studies, that the, the Nurses Health Study, um, the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, that's a portfolio of large studies done through Walter Willett and others at Harvard University. Brilliant studies suffer some weaknesses like the, you know, the food, food frequency questionnaires and things. It's really hard to get accurate measures mm. of what people are really eating. Mm. Um, and you know, out of that study comes things like, well, it looks like it's better for people to eat more oil instead of um, the carbs, people they sometimes mm. say, but hang on, hang on, you know, like, you know, um, it sometimes can be a matter of what's less damaging to the body. I mean, if your carbs are sort of a blend of flour and fat made into a donut or um, a cocoa pops, then, you know, perhaps the olive oil, the extra virgin olive oil might look all right next to those. Um, one of the big recent reports was um, uh, a report on, on that, on, um, you know, like a, they're still crunching and crunching and crunching the Harvard Health Study data. And this study looked at um, 1990 to 2018 
data and um, was looking at um, uh, olive oil and some health outcomes, you know, mortality, and then mortality specifically in reference to um, lung disease, heart disease, um, neurodegenerative disease, <clears throat> and concluded that, um, you know, olive oil reduced death from these these conditions, so we better put olive oil on our food. And then we went and had a close look at this study. And I would say that compared to a lot of foods that Americans eat, given that only about 6% or something is whole plant foods, and they're, you know, quite a few of that's some fried chips. So it probably reduces it down to just, just a few percent as whole plant foods. So I guess, you know, um, some olive oil could you know, be less bad than many other things. But anyway, this study was an example of compared to what? And mm. the subjects on average only consumed nine grams a day of, of oil, of olive oil, nine grams a day, which is half an Australian tablespoon. So that was the high consumer. So it wasn't a big amount. They have big numbers of subjects so they can crunch data on fairly fine differences. Um, and that they, they found that the, the olive, and the article had, you know, infographics of why all the polyphenols and olive oil and, and other factors, you know, why it might be improve your health and reduce disease. And the study found that um, the, the olive oil when was uh, reduced mortality and the mortality from these specific disease groups when compared with butter or margarine or mayonnaise or dairy fat. Now, interesting, this article, which had a you know, spin on olive oil specifically, also compared to other vegetable oils. No difference. In other words, you know, the olive oil was just you know, one of the you know, less saturated fat, less bad, sort of not as bad fats that compared favorably with these even worse ones, but did no better in this study mm. than any of the other vegetable oils. So, you know, as far as it being, it, it's it, wrong for it to be used to promote olive oil in particular. Yeah. I just want to pick up on a little tangent out of that about um, polyphenol. Like oh, yes, I was going to talk to you about that. Yeah. The infographic that Malcolm's referring to was making mm. out like the case for there being some mechanism by which um, olive oil might be healthy. And, um, and, and in fact, when you think about when they talk about nine grams, right? <laughs> now we've got a chart on our website. We, I, mm. a few years ago, I went to great lengths to look up polyphenol to see who's recorded it. Um, there was a, a very, very large group who, who uh, published in 2010 polyphenol count of many, many foods. And the you know very best extra virgin olive oil. When you look at that per hundred grams, it doesn't compare very well to a hundred grams of wheat. It doesn't compare well at all to a hundred grams of blueberries. But what do you think when you start talking about nine grams? There's almost so few polyphenols, you know, when as as measured by you know these reputable mm. less groups. than one blueberry. Um, and and you just think. But I actually saw in social media uh, in the week after that article was published, someone actually saying right now, you know, to my whole food plant-based diet, I'm going to add, you know, half a tablespoon of, of olive oil. And you just think, how do you get the, how do you get there? Mm. The, the mischief, mm. uh, you know, the, the industry mischief is huge because, the, of course, there's a press release that comes out when an article is published. And that's as far as most people go around the world. Mm. It gets into the headlines. And uh, uh, I think this was one where it wasn't open access. So I'm a former librarian, so I'm, I'm talking a bit of lingo here. But to get access to peer-reviewed articles, many of them are behind paywalls. And so mm -hmm. this one was behind a paywall. So mm -hmm. you know that nearly everyone around the world who's commenting on this paper has not read it because it's not easy to get. You've got to have access through a university or a direct subscription to get hold of it. So yes, the polyphenol, um, it's, it's really worth um, <laughs> checking out how it stacks up mm. against other common plant foods for polyphenol count. Absolutely. I think I remember, just, yeah, I think I remember looking at your table and you, know, you had olive oil, but then you had olives. And why not just, eat a couple of olives, but you'll smash it out of the park in terms of polyphenol content. 
you know. Well, um, I joke sometimes, and some you know, we sort of <clears throat> our, our meals sort of rotate randomly, and uh, sometimes it's a Mediterranean vegetable dish, which means yeah. more herbs. It's, it's I'll make it more yeah, Mediterranean herb, yeah. sounding bean, more garlic, yeah. and and I joke and say. Um, Yep, yep, there's olive oil in here. There's unprocessed olive oil because, you know, I've got a few diced olives in here. <laughs> um, yeah, the, and the polyphenols, um, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, a matter of there being, you know, half or twice as much in other plants. It's like even looking per 100 grams, there's about 60, 40, 60 in the best olive oil. And most olive oil consumed, of course, is a cheaper low polyphenol type. But you compare that to 100 grams of spinach, which is about 120, so it's about twice, at least twice as much, or bl blueberries, 200, or flax, 1,500. But then if you adjust it for calories, calorie because you know, density, you're hopefully yeah. not going to have 100 mils of olive oil where you're going to mm -hmm. stack on the way. If you adjust mm -hmm. it per calorie, then it's orders of magnitude. These, these simple plant-based food mm. like spinach and leaves yeah. are orders of magnitude higher. And the research being done, and some of that's been done here in Melbourne, in the mm -hmm. Olive, Olive Wellness Institute and other places. And um, they're really focusing on looking at these substances in olive oil and looking for the health benefits of them. Uh, and the particular, the oleocanthal, the polyphenol in, in olive oil, you know, it'd have to be orders of magnitude more, more biologically active to even compare with mm. the simple act of eating the odd strawberry and eating some spinach and some, some whole wheat. Absolutely. And that's and another really important point that... before you go on is that, you know, we eat for calories, right? So we need, we should be measuring based on the amount per calorie that something has mm. in it, not per gram. That, that's the way I do my work anyway. Um, well, but, mostly, mostly. Yeah. It's, sort of, it's yeah. a little bit confusing. It's got to be relevant to serving size yeah, as well. Yeah, relevant to serving yeah. size as well, yeah. because yeah. when you get Fair to enough. extremely low calorie food, like it's no good saying that, you know, your silver beets high in yes, protein. Yes, I, I agree with that. If, <laughs> if, you know, you eat a giant bowl of it, which we do, and it's, mm. you, know, only, only, you know, it's got so few calories, it's quite yeah. a small no, amount. No, I agree, I agree. I'm sorry, I, I did cut you off, so please carry on. That's no, right. I was, I was rambling on a bit there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess, you know, the whole idea of comparing, I think it's one of the more recent studies was comparing the olive oil to a different type of oil, whereas I think what, what we would be looking for is compare it to no oil and see what, or compare it to olives, the, the whole food, and then let's see what, what gives us the better results. Um, or, or compare it to oats or, or compare yeah. it to chickpeas. Yeah. That is, compare it to one of those starchy, fibre-rich whole plant foods, which sort of mm. brings us to the microbiome. Mm. And I'm not sure, I mean, you know, I know there has been a little bit of research done on, on uh, um, inflammatory bowel disease and diet, and, and it does seem to, you know, uh, point towards diets that are plant-based, mm -hmm. generally, you know, high mm. in fibre. Mm -hmm. um, when we think of our understanding of, the, of the, the gut microbiome, the microbes that make short chain fatty acids that maintain the health of the lining of the gut, that, that actually maintain cardiovascular, brain, et cetera, uh, you know, metabolic health, the short chain fatty acids are produced by, um, from fiber and resistant starch. And of course, particularly resistant starch that's going to come from the uh, high fiber starchy foods. Mm. Um, and, and this is where I have a bit of a question mark about, um, you know, there's no question mark about, about um, the oils, actually, because when you eat more fats, your body has to, it's, as you point out, it's harder to, to absorb, to uh, digest them. When you put fats in the stomach, you know, the, the mm. movement of food out of the stomach into the intestine slows right down. The movement okay. of food in the small intestine slows mm. right down. You might get more SIBO. Mm -hmm. And you change the microbiome content of the... Uh, mm -hmm. the yeah, I mean, colon. even the gallbladder has to work harder to produce the bile to emulsify the fat. Well, so. that's, that's, and, and that's not without consequence. Um, mm. When your gallbladder pumps out more, uh, more bile, um, that, that encourages the growth down in the colon uh, of uh, microbes, obviously. You know, if yep. you eat more meat, you get big digesting microbes. My favorite one, more. Bilophilia wadsworthia. The bile eating bacteria <laughs> produces hydrogen sulfide. It's lovely. It's exactly what we don't want. <laughs> but no gas. 
Smell my rotten egg gas? No, no, because that wouldn't have much. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's the problem. If when when you um, put more or more fat into the system in general, um, then you have more bilophilia wads worthier, turning those bile acids into secondary bile acids, which are carcinogenic, and also mm. creating other compounds along the way, like hydrogen sulfide. And there's a strong association between. Uh, bilophilia wads worthy, uh, for example, an inflammatory bowel disease you know, with ulcerative colitis. Um, and here's where I have a bit of a question mark about you know, um, whole, whole food, not talking about all whole food plant-based uh, diets that are more on the fat-rich nut end of the spectrum. Uh, I know that the dietary fiber sort of dampens down wads worthier, mm. but uh, you know, I, I sort of wonder what the net effect is when you're eating a lot of those foods, whether mm. you still have quite a few more wads worthier down there, breaking down bile acids. I'd um, say so because making... because we get contacted with a lot of people by a lot of people who have been on a plant based diet, but they've still got IBD, and it's not necessarily made them made it go away or um, they've been on a processed vegan diet or a high fat vegan diet and it's brought it on. So it's, it's just being on a vegan diet or a plant-based diet. If you don't understand that the low fat aspect is quite important, it can still create issues in the body. And, um, yeah, we see it a fair bit actually. That's a good question. Mm. Yeah, a good, good kind of, No, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. very interested mm. to hear about that observation. Mm. This is mm. where this is where we wish science was going. Like you Absolutely. know, when you when you read of research papers that have um, been funded by industry to try and find an edge to their product, versus mm. you know why aren't why isn't there research teams trying to really drill down on? We already know this is healthy and that's healthy. Well, let's just drill down a little further and find out what the difference is. We've mm. actually been at conferences and asked a couple of key gastroenterologists that have given presentations about this um, question about mm -hmm. the higher fat whole plant foods and they actually don't know because there isn't research mm. that's going to show um, these differences mm. yeah yeah no i think i think anytime you're you're putting more load onto the body with the higher fat you know all all, all the organs have to work harder to kind of process it and digest it and try and try and deal with it um so yeah i think there's a very good argument for continuing with what we know that works which is the low fat mm -hmm. side of the whole food plant-based diet we know it affected there's so much mm -hmm. evidence from the research and anecdotally that that says that yes this works you know and, and i'm of the opinion of if something's not broken why do we want to try and fix it um, mm. And until you can give me a very compelling reason as to why I should deviate from something that's working so effectively um, and, 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 and almost in so many different situations, you know, like the same kind of diet, heart disease and, and certain forms of cancer and, and um, diabetes. And, and we know the digestive benefits of the fiber for the gut, you know, like for so many different reasons, it's a good idea. Why would I try and shift something unless you give me a very very compelling reason it's not just you know have have this little bit of extra processed fat in moderation you know, give me a really compelling reason to mm. to make that make that change um that's oh, that's the way i would look at it anyway. no that that's that's a very good way of looking at shakur because mm. um you know if if um ornish and pritikin and mcdougall and, and Bernard and McDougall, you know, have all used this sort of diet to, um, you know, help get people healthy Did with reverse disease. Yeah, yes, twice. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> twice. That's right. We, 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 yeah, it's their system. Yeah. But even like, you uh, know, people, even the, even the, even the, the work that, you know, Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Clapper does at True North Health Center, um, mm. you know, um, and, and Doug Lyle up there, you know, it's all the same approach. It's, it's, yeah, it's so incredible. if this works, if this yeah. works then, and we've got all this evidence that it mm. works, mm. and people say to me, well, show me the evidence that oil's bad, the onus is on them to, um, you know, show the, the high oil, uh, oil diet. Actually, mm. there's so many reasons why oil's not healthy. Mm. Even the onus is on, on them to sort of create more studies to show that, yes, you can reverse heart disease with a high nut avocado diet, et cetera. The onus mm. is on on the people who, who, you know, 
yeah. want to argue about that to sort of do studies and show that it works as well. And then if it does, then I'll, I'll sort of change what mm. I recommend. And say, well, obviously, I we would, would too. be skeptical yeah. because um, we, we see the consequences as mm. you do mm. from in so many different sort of disease, chronic disease states. Mm. We see the consequences where someone just, you know, takes that whole food plant-based diet a little up in the fat mm. and, mm. And, uh, and, and, and the oil mm. and, and the you know, whether it's presenting back in emergency with angina or something, you know, Malcolm's had patients who have been doing whole food plant-based. Doing strict whole foods plant-based, they go off on a little bit of a different bit. path. And next thing, you know, you get mm. a letter the letter from the emergency department presented with an episode of angina. I want to take a tiny tangent here and just tell you something interesting we found, because one of the stories about adding oil mm. is you add oil and you absorb the uh, fat-soluble vitamins better. Uh, and you absorb the fat soluble phytonutrients. That's the story. That was the, you know, like the uh, carotenoids and things. Yeah, I've heard that story. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and with, with the sort of. Oh, some it's of that, taught in nutrition. It's taught that nutrition. Mm -hmm. Jenny had a nutrition textbook right. at Deacon that actually quoted one study funded by um, a salad dressing company. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we looked into this and, and particularly found quite a lot of work done with. Uh, um, very detailed work done with uh, vitamin E mm. um, and uh, and what they actually found is that if you consume those fat soluble uh, vitamins like vitamin E uh, with, with a zero fat meal which of course you know all our meals hard to put you know, together the, hard to put together, the salad you know, dressing company did put together yeah. it's like oh, you know lettuce and carrot and there's a like few if, a few vegetables if, you, you if you'd added brown rice to it or something you would have messed it up because it'd be a little bit fat mm. in that you know our, our diet a 10 percent fat diet is going to have you know 20 plus grams of natural fats per day in it anyway what they found was that for example with the vitamin e that it was still absorbed into the cells lining the gut that, that it was still absorbed in the complete absence of fats in the diet <laughs> but it didn't appear in the blood immediately it sort of came into the cell and sort of sat there like in the waiting room. And when subsequent meals came along with little bits of fat, Smart. the cell then packaged it up into fat globules and sent it off um, you know, to the lymphatics in the bloodstream. And so there were the, um, the, the, uh, um, the transporter proteins in the cell membranes of the gut cells can absorb those um, nutrients with no with no fat in the diet, uh, which is not going to happen, but certainly with a low fat diet. And so that includes, you know, the vitamin D, the vitamin K, the vitamin E, the phytosterols, the carotenoids, but then they'll sit in the cell and gradually get released into the blood when little bits of fat come along. So that was very interesting to find that research mm. that, that completely smashes the story that we'll continue to hear for decades to come that, you know, that somehow we need to pour, um, you know, oil on our on our salad to absorb the. Uh, or, or have a steak with their salad as uh, one, one nutritionist. One said. nutritionist we definitely <laughs> won't fame and name. Um, actually, had a little piece where the person was already eating steak mm -hmm. and vegetables, and she suggested adding some oil to help absorb to provide some fat to help absorb nutrients. <laughs> like there wasn't yeah. enough in the steak. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, fascinating stuff, and I think, um, yeah, there's there's so much misinformation out there, and, and I think it's important. It's, you know, really important. Is why I wanted to make this video is that we really have to question things, and don't just accept them on face value. You really have to question it. You know, and as you guys said, compare it to what, and and also look at the way the study is conducted before we start running off with with wild raving um you know kind of you know decisions around let's start adding these things and I, and I do agree with you that that the onus needs to be on the the people promoting adding oil into the diet that this is going to work better than what's already working so well you know or it may be even just as well because that's if it does that it's it's still pretty amazing you know uh, what the whole food plant based diet can do but I think we know biologically and physiologically what what the higher fat um, content in the diet does to the body so i don't see how by adding fat to your extra fat to your diet you're going to get to a better outcome because 
that doesn't make sense from a physiological perspective. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Um, I, I'm sort of, um, my counter argument here would be, you know, I could understand why having, uh, you know, a little bit of flax seed, you know, ground up in your breakfast, you know, rich source of that, that type of fiber in flax is super healthy, mm, mm. For a number of reasons, and, and it's really high in omega threes, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't need to be very much, you know, it's no. not sort of a huge amount of our calories. And I wouldn't be adding flax seed oil because if I added the flax seed oil, um, well, it might not be handled in the same way and the body might be you know, absorbed and make my blood go fatty quickly or something. But mm. if I added the oil, I wouldn't be getting the beneficial effect of the amazing fiber, the mm. lignans that mm -hmm. are in the flax. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't be eating some of these more overt fats in small amounts. I think there's some very good nutrition benef nutritional benefits to adding. But not the flax. processed ones. Like no, no, like right. Those no, that I, come in a bottle completely agree so like you know flax seeds chia seeds walnuts they're all all you know in small amounts i think they're, they're very healthy um depending on what you're trying to achieve right like if you're um, i think if you've got ibd then some of these things can be harder to process um if you're trying to be lose weight then adding extra fat for a period of time maybe not the best idea um and um you know so based on what you're trying to achieve what your health goals are then, then obviously you might need to tweak a few things here and there. And I'm sure you guys would, would do yeah, that. Yeah, we, we have a traffic light, a sort of traffic light system. And um, mm. we put a lot of those uh, higher fat plant foods in the orange traffic light. Mm. And, you know, it, it depends who you are. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're the person who's trying to lose weight, reverse heart disease, reverse inflammatory bowel disease, you know, reverse your insulin resistance that's underlying mm. your diabetes, then you want to keep those, uh, um, not just the oils, but the fat-rich plant foods very low. Mm. But, you know, if you're someone who's athletic or you're a skinny child or you're someone who's sort of struggling to take in enough mm. Uh, mm. calories, um, then, you know, there's more, and you, you know, you're health, young and healthy, then there's more room in your diet for those um, fat-rich whole plant foods. But, um, you know, even if you are that skinny child or that athlete, I mean, you, you don't want to eat food that's had all the nutrients and fiber strips. So you still don't want to put the meal on your food. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a good example. Like my kids, they've been, you know, from conception, they've been on a plant-based diet and, and they're on the, the leaner side of the spectrum, right? So we have no problem with them eating over fats like avocados and things like that. And it helps them meet their calorie needs. And for children, again, it's slightly different to an adult, right? Like we might buy five, four or five, six avocados a week and the kids would probably eat four or five of those. Um, but if it was just me and my wife, you know, maybe one or two a week would suffice. Um, so it's, it's a totally, it really depends on the stage of life that you're at, the, the, the kind of situation that you've got health-wise, what your goals are, and, and then you kind of adapt your diet. And when you do lose the weight and you're at a healthy weight now and you're active and you're doing that, of course, why not add a few more, um, you know, walnuts or black seeds into your diet to, to supplement that, um, you know, those extra omega-3s and things like that. Absolutely. All right. I think we've covered a really, uh, really amazing uh, broad <laughs> range of topics, but we, I think we definitely got to the whole idea of, you know, what some of this research is talking about with olive oil and the fact that, um, uh, we need to be a little bit more um, aware of what we're comparing it to and that it's not actually giving the same outcomes as what the whole food plant-based diet does without oil, obviously. Um, and mm -hmm. we're not getting those same results and no one's showing that at this stage. So, you know, for us, the gold standard is, is um, taking out the processed foods and keeping whole food plant-based as mm -hmm. it's designed yeah. to be low fat whole food plant-based that's the gold standard for for what it takes to be healthy reverse disease prevent disease and which is even better so thank you so much for taking the time um, to come and share that knowledge with us um, we really appreciate it and um, just um, well if you want to find out more about what Malcolm and Jenny do they've got um, they've got a great company that does um, immersion projects here in Australia they they take people away for seven days and teach them all about the science and they go through and you know they feed them for seven days and and people really notice big big changes in their health when they go on one of these programs and it's a wonderful thing to do and if you have the opportunity to if you're in australia and you have the opportunity to go along to 
to Merkel and Ginny's program, please do it um, because you'll learn a lot and, and you'll come out of it a lot healthier. So um, they also have a fantastic Facebook group, which I absolutely love. It's called Whole Food Plant-Based Aussies. I think, what has it got past 15,000 people now? Coming up to 20,000 people? 17,000 people. 17, people. So it's growing, growing very fast. And it's a really wonderful community um, where we've been able to get, you know, if you have a question about a whole food plant-based diet, you know, you'll get an answer from either Jenny or one of the admins or one of the other really well-informed people in that group. So um, we'll, I'll put the description to a few of your, you know, your website. And your website has been a huge, fascinating resource um, of all the different whole food plant-based topics. Um, and, and both Jenny and Malcolm have done a great job researching different topics. And almost any kind of question you have on a whole food plant-based diet, you'll find an answer to that with the evidence, which I love. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely be putting links to where you can find um, find more about what Malcolm and Jenny do in the description below. So um, thank you for everything that you guys are doing for the community, and um, you know, just um, let's keep spreading that that positive message of how to be healthy. Thank you so much, Nicole. I mean, we could have talked for a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> We've talked about many other studies that yeah. supposedly purport to sell the benefits of olive oil, but I mm. think we, you know, captured it in in the key one that we did. The other mm. thing I just wanted to explain is that we're we're sort of shifting a little bit in terms of our marketing to we've got the the company that sort of. Um, overseas all our programs is Melbourne Lifestyle Medicine mm -hmm. so we're now more um, focusing our programs are more you know they're, they're more than just nutrition it's it's lifestyle medicine and Wonderful. all the domains so at our immersion retreat it's very much focused mm -hmm. on all of those things and so you might see we, we've we've got a Facebook page for our sort of old identity plant-based health Australia and mm -hmm. we've got Melbourne Lifestyle Medicine. Well, we, so we've got a new website for Melbourne we still Lifestyle really have. Yeah, we've What we've done, Melbourne Lifestyle Medicine is more about our, our programs, which are sort of <laughs> lifestyle, including, of course, plant-based nutrition is a big part of it. Mm. And we still have plant-based uh, plant health Australia as primarily the sort of nutrition information and resources. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, you're, doing, you're doing great stuff. And, I'm, and I'm, you know, obviously there's, You've, you've touched the lives of thousands of people here in Australia and around the world. So I'm sure- Well, you too, Shakur. Um, you. Keep up your good work that you're doing to, uh, uh, with people with uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And I was you, just yes. thinking, you could invite us back and we could talk about salt next, <laughs> which has an impact on- oh, I actually would really love to do that. We'll definitely we'll definitely book that. And that, that's gonna be a great topic because I'm I'm, you know, I've, I've only just never, I haven't really delved deep into the whole salt thing as much as I would like to have done. So um, it's definitely something. The, bigger we, the deeper we dig, the more we find. Yes, I know. <laughs> the deeper we dig, the worse it looked. Yes, it does. I know. I know. It's, it's not, it's, it's not, it doesn't, it's not a good sign for the, the microbiome from what I've already seen of it. And um, mm. yeah, we need to either cut it down um, or, or completely eliminate it from the diet. So. Um, it's definitely something that I'm, I'm keen to do. So let's, we'll organize that. I'll be in touch about that. Um, but um, for, for everyone that's been watching this video or listening to the podcast, thank you for joining us. And I, I hope you've uh, got a new appreciation if you hadn't already about, about what um, oil does to the body and that it's not necessarily um, the magic food that uh, the industry wants you to believe it is. And, um, you know, getting out of your diet is going to make things much, much better for you. Um, you know, if you're watching on YouTube and if you haven't subscribed to our channel, click that little subscribe button and the bell notification icon that will give you uh, uh, updates of all our recent uploads. And also, if you have a question, there's a comment section there. So ask away. and We'll try and answer it as best as we can. And if you're listening on the podcast, please follow and subscribe to the podcast so you get updates of all our new episodes. And we've got one coming out every week. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Malcolm and Jenny. And for everyone who's listening or watching, make sure you eat plants and lots of them. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>